You're at your old trusty boat. You call my tea sparrow. I'm in the city of Mardi Gras. Welcome to the Sailing into Oblivion podcast, where we hear stories from everyday people who do extraordinary things. I'm your host, Jerome Rand. Good evening, and we are live here at uh, at Jerome's town, actually, of all places. It's real uh, Pier, Michigan, going on up here. I am in the woods, still in the tents that uh, I purchased so that I could ease back into life uh, around civilization after my. 2017 sail around the world and uh yeah this is the third summer now that i've been able to escape up here for a couple of weeks and uh yeah had to had to had to put some uh, plywood on the platforms and just get everything a little ramped up because it had been sitting out here in the woods through winters and all that sort of stuff. But uh, same tents, still working, a little bit leaky, and but everything seems to be okay. So uh, tonight I am taking a little break from just sitting out and enjoying the woods, and I wanted to talk about sailing books, uh, specifically the books that sort of got me interested in solo sailing and then also obviously going around the world and trying for, you know, some sort of big epic voyage. And um, so it's going to be sort of a condensed list, just just sort of my favorites. Nothing nothing crazy, no rankings or anything like that, but uh, there are, I've read so many books about ocean voyages and the good and the bad, all that sort of stuff. Um, And I don't know, the ones that we're going to get into, I'm just going to keep kind of naming off ones. But um, I think what I'm going to do, spoiler alert, uh, not that, you know, if somebody writes a sailing book about a, a voyage, typically that means a person survived. So I don't know how it could really be a spoiler, but I will be talking about some of my favorite parts of the books and and stuff like that. I mean, I think if you pick up a uh, a sailing book, you sort of know you know the ending, or maybe I don't know who who knows who knows. But in any event, uh, uh, if you uh, just want a concise list of the books that I I absolutely fell in love with and uh, always have on my boat and have read many times and all that sort of stuff, then maybe what I'll do is uh, put put a list in the details or maybe at the end of the podcast do a list. I don't know. In case you just don't want to know anything about the actual book, you just want to know what the books are. Who knows? I don't know. I'm I'm. It's been... My brain is a little off because it's we've we've definitely had a few late nights over the last few days. Lots of friends, lots of family, and it's been a blast. But uh, you know, I'm an old man. I'm an old guy, uh, 42 years old. Whew. And as uh, good old Indiana says, it's not the uh, it's not the years, it's the miles. And I think nothing could be further from the truth or no nothing could be closer to the truth <laughs> in my case oh man i don't i don't i it's the funniest thing because i don't feel old when i look in the mirror i pretty much still see the person i've seen for the last 20 years but i, I there's something there's like a hint it's like it's coming uh, i don't know i don't know what it is the aches and pains aren't really there yet, but uh, I, don't, I don't know. There's there's a feeling of uh, old age coming in. I think it's just in the ready to go out and do whatever and go crazy all day and and then carry that on into the night. Maybe that's maybe that's what's sort of missing. I'm still doing it, but it's just not uh, not as often. I don't know. It's it's funny actually because I I was talking with my parents tonight and I. I think I think everything always comes around to you know trying to live 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 a life that uh 
that you enjoy and 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 feel like you've actually squeezed every bit of life out of it because boy i tell you if 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 something comes out with i think one of the quotes was was basically that uh you know everybody nobody really considers that health is their number one priority until something goes wrong until that bad diagnosis or something like that and uh and then all of a sudden you're like dang holy cow I I remember when there was nothing wrong with me and it was great. And I, I'm not saying this because I have something wrong with me, but uh, it just, I don't know. It's one of those things where I feel like if you live that way, if you sort of go into each day thinking, you know, this this could be the last day that I am living, you know, I'm living in a certain way and not living under the guise of this this unknown thing or something's happened. I don't know. Who knows? Dude? Maybe it's just all the vaccine talk and stuff. But jeez. Who knows? Who knows? Anyway, back on track here. Um sailing books. Man, I'll tell you, it was it was pretty much what got me into it. Or not what got me into sailing per se, but as soon as I started reading them. It got me wanting to get out there and solo sail uh, and venture to the places where sailors, uh, I don't want to say get tested, but uh, definitely have to, They, I don't know, you find out. It's, it's hard to describe for sure what it's like to go to a place like the Southern Ocean or be just you know in the Atlantic during hurricane season or even just go up the east coast but doing it on your own there's there's something about um about uh, i guess giving yourself over to mother nature in that way because the sea i mean the wind rules the sea and the sea just can absolutely rule any vessel that that dares uh, sail upon it. So it's one of those things, um, these books just, they, they had me first just curious. Well, no, I'd say first it was amazed, then it was curious. And then it just sort of flipped a switch in my head where I, I figured it just, it had to happen. I, I had to see what it was like. So, uh, the first book, uh, was, was actually, not even it was a solo sailor book, but it wasn't um okay, so just had to take a little break, but uh yeah, the first book, the one that started it all, I guess you could say uh was a recommendation from my cousin, and this was jeez, this was back in the very early two thousands, so I was in my very early twenties. What a time, what a time uh and it was God Forsaken Sea by Derek lundy and this book basically is about the 97-98 Vendée Globe race where the boats, as far as I could surmise from, from the book and, and from reading about it, basically they started building these boats just thinking of speed. And speed outweighed safety. And these, I think they were 60-foot uh, 60 foot boats, uh, that were built basically so wide. They, they basically look like a, uh, windsurf board, but with a giant mast and all this sort of stuff, it was all about just all out speed. And these guys went down there, guys and girls, and just had a, I think they entered in what Motissier used to say was a, uh, you know, you get one good, uh, summer season in the Southern Ocean for every two bad ones. So I think they went at a bad one for sure. And they get down there and it's just breakage after breakage and major rescues by Pete Goss and all the sort of stuff. There's just, it, it was, it, it's such an epic uh, trip down that race and what, what happened and what unfolded and the way they lay the book out. It's kind of cool. Cause even I, even though it's not about the race, the first, the first like chapter is just about the author uh, sailing, I think from the East coast down to 
the Virgin Islands and, you know, getting into some heavy weather and, and what his experience was like. And, you know, for a lot of sailors, the idea, the thought, the dream of, of doing a solo nonstop is, and I know it was for me, uh, is, is sort of like the ultimate. There isn't really much, much more. I mean, if you can rip around the planet, it's just, it's a mental and physical test and a test of your equipment and your, uh, it's, it's crazy the, the amount that goes into it. But, uh, he describes thinking and wishing and, and, you know, sort of dreaming about that, that opportunity. And I know plenty of other sailors that have talked to me and said they'd like to try and all that sort of stuff. And so he starts out with that, but they get in some heavy weather. It's like he and his wife and, uh, <laughs> They talk about how how scary it is, and it is scary. I mean, especially at night when when the waves heap up and things get a little chaotic. Uh, it's it's exhilarating, but it is. It's also it's also pretty scary. So then he goes on, and and the way they lay the book out is great. I mean, it's it, I wouldn't say it's hard to follow by any means, but um, it skips around like I think a good book does because start to finish can be a little little difficult when it when it comes to sailing stuff um you know I, who knows who knows but uh absolutely amazing the 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 writing is fantastic there's tons of information on the Vande Globe and stuff and and the history of it and and he throws back to Mauticier to Sir Robin Knox Johnson all that stuff it's just it's a it's a great look into the past of solo sailing or solo racing around the world, but a great description of one of the most chaotic. And I, I think I want to say two people died in that race, but it might've just been one. Um, but anytime something like that, an event like that ends up in, you know, somebody passing away, it's, 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 it's an eye opener and it just it's just such a great book absolutely 100% recommend it and um yeah that was the first one that just it, before i read god forsaken sea i had no idea people sailed boats around the world by themselves and i just just reading that i i was i lost it i was like holy cow this is this is actually something people do what so Definitely recommend the old Godforsaken Sea. Um, I would put it in the uh, probably the top ten for sure, and it it made this list. But uh, it also made this list because it transitions into <clears throat> probably the most influential book uh, out of the list for me, as far as getting uh, a fire lit under my ass and 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 figuring out a way to actually attempt this sort of stuff. And that was uh, A Voyage for Mad Men by Peter Nichols. And this this book just blew me away. So it's, it's basically the story of the 1968-1969 Golden Globe, which was the predecessor or the original, the first race for what turned into the Vendee Globe. And it's you know it, it's following all of the sailors it gives you good great detail on all of the voyages that went into that cuz it's basically nine guys start out i think there were a total of of 10 um there was i, I want to say he was an italian guy on a big boat uh but things didn't work out and he didn't even get to really start but the rest of them nine nine sailors set out and I think that's on the cover where it says, you know, nine sailors set out and only one returned sort of thing, which is a little misleading because it's not like the eight of them died uh, and they just didn't make it all the way. But um, it gives great detail into prior to the race, during the race. And it even, thankfully, because I really was glad they had this, they, they gave just a, a brief synopsis of what happened to each sailor after the race, you know, after everything was said and done. And, and it actually is kind of a spookier part because you read about one of the sailors and, uh, it doesn't end well. Let's just say that. I, I don't want to spoil that one too much, but no, it's, it's a really great book and the, the hardships and everything 
that they go through. It's in great detail. It definitely, I would say, follows uh, Donald Crowhurst. Uh, it's a little weighted on the onto that side because that's such a compelling and interesting story to to sort of. And I I don't really know why. I don't know why somebody dying out at sea or somebody losing it out at sea is the most interesting thing. Um, you know, and that actually with the last Golden Globe race or the one in 2018, you know, I really still haven't seen a whole lot of of some of those guys that made it through those really really rough storms. I mean, I you hear about the people that dismast and have to be rescued and all that stuff, but there were people that were in that approximate place who made it through there and I kind of want to know what they did, what their tactic was and and all that sort of stuff, but uh regardless the the eight sixty eight and sixty nine trip around the world. It just the the cast of characters in that book is so good, and and Peter Nichols does a great job of of giving you just enough information because it's 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 one of those books that easily could have been six hundred pages long if they really wanted to get into like the history and build the characters up and stuff, but. He doesn't. He keeps it. He keeps it concise and keeps everything moving. Um, you know, I'm no, I'm no uh, book critic by any means at all. But uh, I really, really enjoyed the way it's laid out. And you know, with that cast of characters, they're able to jump from one person to another and keep the story, you know, hopping around and everything, which which I definitely like. So, so that one is really, really, really good. Totally recommend it. But I will say you got to watch out because if it gets into your head like it got into mine, you know, that the fact that they're on these old boats and some of these guys are on just boats that have no business, no business being out in the Atlantic, let alone the Southern Ocean. Um, I don't know. Something it, it, it definitely Godforsaken Sea showed me that people do this. A Voyage for Mad Men somehow put in my head that it's actually possible for anyone to do this. And by anyone, I just mean I'm going to try it. <laughs> so it, uh, I don't know, it's infectious and it, it's its such a compelling story and there's heroes and I don't know, it's just so crazy. I, I, th- I think what really enthralled me was... When Mauticier comes around Cape Horn, is in the South Atlantic, could head up, you know, take the race, all that stuff. Spoiler alert, uh, decides to just keep going around the planet uh, to, for another, I don't know, 15,000 miles. Basically crosses the Indian Ocean again, goes into the Pacific, and then stops up in Tahiti, or the Tuamotos. And there was something about his... The fact that he did that, that he wanted to stay out and see as the Southern Ocean summer came to a close and the winter came in, I don't know. I just, when I read that, I thought, holy cow, this guy figured some stuff out, out there. He His priorities were just all set. And he had a miserable time on that last chunk of the voyage as well. I mean, the, the gales obviously were way more intense. Um, I think he saw he saw worse weather. Uh, he saw worse weather in the, just in the Indian ocean than he did, uh, the whole time in the South, uh, or Southern ocean, um, to get around, you know, I mean, it was, he, he definitely got into the Southern ocean right at the right time and was able to ride very, very good weather all the way through. I don't think he had a severe gale and even by that i don't think it was all that bad uh until the pacific and then the weather at cape horn got a little snorty as they say and uh as it as it does but i don't know it it was just incredible to uh to get to get a whole bunch of different perspectives and the other guys that only made it a certain amount and how they gave up and why they gave up and then obviously the stuff with donald crowhurst is is just crazy, you know, going down and 
faking his position, but he's on a boat that's basically sinking. And oh man, I, I the one thing that that really I related to mm, ah, was when Donald Crowhurst had to cannibalize uh, screws from other parts of his boat to fix his wind vane. And I'm just thinking to myself, there's definitely been times where I'm scrambling around trying to figure out if I have the right part and can actually get things back online and having to pull something. You know, whenever you have to pull some bolt that's functioning and holding something together apart to use somewhere else that already broke once, it's a scary feeling because you know that if it breaks again, then you no longer have that bolt. And I don't know. It's, I I can't even imagine there. There were so many situations that that guy was in that, uh, I just, I've related to so much, especially after, you know, my big trip, but even just on the training stuff that I was doing in the Caribbean, you know, just out there for three, four days by yourself, um, running into some of these issues. But it is pretty crazy. I, I know there's a few. There's like a, a movie I think made. I know there's documentaries about Donald Crowhurst and and what what he went through. But I will say, in the end, uh, the last voyage where I was stuck in the Atlantic, I I like to tell people that that know about uh, solo sailing and the history of it. I I tell them I basically I got to understand just a little bit more about what Donald actually went through out there, uh, that, that feeling of being stuck, stuck on the sea with no, no, no port, no calm place to actually go to. You just have to be out there for a certain period of time. And, uh, I don't know. It's, it's scary. It's definitely scary. I never thought once on the first trip that I was ever going to lose my mind, even when I was rationing and didn't have much water and all this sort of stuff. But on that second trip, I don't know. It it definitely affected my brain in a way that I was not prepared for and um, could not have foreseen. I thought, oh, I've spent nine months at sea. It's totally fine. I can handle that. That's no big deal. Boy, it was only 40, 50 days into that trip when I started to absolutely lose it. So kind of strange. Kind of strange. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of these books... I think when I was reading, I all I wanted to do was emulate these guys, and uh, I think I got more than I bargained for sometimes. But um, so that's that's uh, a voyage for Mad Men by Peter Nichols, and that and that obviously uh, led me straight into Bernard Motissier and his writings, and uh, it, it was pretty much because his role in that in in Peter Nichols' book was this. Captain Nemo. I think there's even a picture of him, and it, it it says, you know, not since Captain Nemo has anybody ever felt so comfortable at sea. And it was just I had to know more. I needed to I needed to understand what the heck the history of Bernard Motissier was. Uh, and so I, I went for the long way. And there's a French French name for it and all that sort of stuff, but. Uh, in English, it's called The Long Way by Bernard Motissier, and it's about his trip around the world during that race. No, you shouldn't even say that. His trip around one and a half of the world, or whatever it was. I think it, it turned out to be 45,000 miles, which I think still to this day has got to be the third or fourth longest sail uh, ever, solo sail ever. Um, I think the longest... I don't know, either mileage or time, who who knows, but uh, I guess it really doesn't even matter. But John Sanders, I think that's his last name, the Australian guy, he's done, he did like 645 days. Um, there was another guy, oh, I can't remember his name now, but he was on a big, big old ship, and he was out there for like a thousand days or something. Um Oh, it's like Reed Stowe. I think that was his name. Good guy. Uh, he he emailed me actually after after my trip, so he gets kudos points. You know, solo guys got to stick together. And then uh, Randall Reeves. He, I don't know what his nonstop days were, but 
probably up in the 300 count, something like that. So those are some long trips, man. Anything over, over, I think, 100 days out at sea is a long time to be by yourself. So kudos to anybody that's done that. Uh, but his, his, his writing, Montissier's writing is, is pretty cool. And I, I wanted to emulate that a little bit, um, with my book, not so much in his same fashion as far as the way he describes the sea and what he's doing and all that sort of stuff, but in the way that it seemed like he just didn't care about the the normal way to write a story and write a book and edit it and make sure it's all put together this way or that. I, I sort of wanted, I felt like when I was reading his book, it was exactly how he wanted it to be and he didn't want anybody to change it. And so that's, that's sort of, that was a mental guide for me when I was writing my book. And, uh, even though they're they're definitely very different, I I don't know. It it was kind of cool. I, I have to give him respect for that because it's his book is not the easiest one to get through by any means. Uh, most long distance solo sailing books aren't easy to get through. I I would say the ones like Godforsaken Sea and A Voyage for Mad Men those definitely keep you sort of on the edge because they're. They're written almost like you would think of a movie about the same subject would be written. But when you go into sort of the long form, start to finish, uh, round the world sailing book, it can become a bit daunting. And uh, and I don't know. I just you're 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 trying to get through it, but at the same time, in some ways, that's kind of the way it should be because in order to fully understand what it's like to be out there trying to get through it, you, you almost have to suffer <laughs> a little bit when you read these books uh, because these guys are definitely suffering out there through sometimes. There's super high highs, but boy, the lows are pretty tough. And so, I don't know, it... it it was something that I thought about with my book, and uh, I I definitely must have picked that up from Matissier. But he goes through and and gives really good detail of of what life is like for him aboard, and and sort of his outlook. I I would say that's the biggest thing with that book is it it really clues you into his outlook of what it was like for him to be out at sea and how much he took in what was around him. And then just the workings of this boat that he built, which still to my mind today, uh, to my, <laughs> still to this day just boggles my mind that these guys, you know, actually built their own boats and then took them around the world. I mean, ugh, that's so far beyond anything I could ever even attempt. Um, you know, I need... I need something that's, uh, you know, they've stamped about a thousand of those boats out already and uh, true, tried, and tested. That's the one I'm going for, not not the one that I knock up in the backyard. Not that these guys did that, but uh, still, it's <laughs> my hat's off to anybody that builds their own boat and heads out to sea because that is so cool. It just mystifies me that, uh, that that's a possibility. So, uh so yeah, those those that that book, uh, the long way, really really cool. It was it was definitely a guidebook. It was aboard during the uh, the trip around the world, and essentially his book uh, became one of the guides for me. So when I had questions, when I when I was in a a, a sketchy spot somewhere in the Southern Ocean, I would go to the chapters where he was at the same place and see what his weather was and what he was doing. So it was actually very helpful. You know, for instance, the, when he crossed the Indian ocean, he went all the way up to, I believe like 36 or 38 degrees South. So he, he did, um, you know, Knox Johnson had to stay further or he stayed further South and just got bashed across the Indian ocean where Montissier found lighter winds, variable winds, and I followed suit 
and actually headed up to yeah around there 37 degrees nor or south um in the south indian ocean and found lots of of light variable winds also found uh cyclone irving or cyclone irving found me i should say but uh it was interesting to to sort of trace my path and my weather and and what i dealt with alongside of Motissier. and and i think that's where some of these books really will always sort of be sticking with me is is the fact that um i can i can read those books and then think right back to when I was right there in pretty much those same positions and uh, dealing with very similar situations. So really cool. I would just say that his, uh, his writing is uh, almost poetic. I don't know. I, you can, you feel his love for the ocean and the boat, Joshua, all that stuff. It just, it really is, um, it's it's a gift that he was he was able to just throw down a couple of books for the world to always be able to learn from his his voyages and uh his outlook so definitely definitely love that book um really really good so voyage or uh the long way bernard motissier and um we're going to jump back to Motissier because he does have some other ones that are uh, big, big time favorites. But to sort of stay in that same realm, um, a book that probably was as close to a reference book for me as anything uh, on these voyages and before the voyages would be a world of a world of my own by Sir Robin Knox Johnson. And that's his recollection or his memoir of going around the world and winning the Golden Globe race in 1968-69 out at sea for 300. And I want to say in the book it says 312 days. Uh, I've I've heard 310, 313, who knows, but um, more than 300 days out there in a boat very, very similar to Mighty Sparrow except his was wood made out of teak. Uh, I think it was built in India uh, when he was in the, I don't think it was the Merchant Navy. I'm not sure. I'd, I'd have to actually look back. But it was he was basically uh, in some form of the, the Merchant Marines or something like that um, as far as England goes. And uh, he ended up with a couple of buddies sailing the boat back from, from the Indian Ocean around the Cape of Good Hope and back to England. And even though he tried to uh, get sponsorship uh, to build a bigger boat and all this sort of stuff, he couldn't get it, and so he just took the boat that he had. And I don't know, it was, it was just such an amazing, amazing feat of uh, just never giving up. I mean, if there's ever a story about somebody who should have gave up and was completely qualified to give up numerous times but he never did um it's it's this book it's just absolutely unbelievable to you you just start reading and just like things keep going wrong and he just deals with them he figures out the problems and and he even took you know there's so there's the three the the three great capes, which would be Cape of Good Hope, Cape Lewin, and uh, Cape Horn. And then there's also, they call them the five stormy capes. So you add in Tasmania and New Zealand. And he, his route, my well, my route was to go south of the five capes. His route was basically uh, to go south of the three capes. But then go in between Tasmania. He went through the Bass Strait, which is insane. And then I think he went in between Stewart Island and the South Island on New Zealand. And just riddled with rocks and reefs and shallows and all this sort of stuff. I mean, it was really, really cool. When, when, if you ever get a chance to look at his route close up in those areas, it's just... it's. It boggles my mind why anybody would do that. But he was also trying to connect up with um, 
forget the guy's name, but it was sort of his publicist or some newspaper guy. And uh, anyway, the 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 trials and tribulations that uh, he goes through are 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 pretty unbelievable. And it that book for sure, like I said, was a big time reference for me because he had just he related. He talks about all the problems and. He, it's more of a nuts and bolts, this is how I got around the world uh, sort of book and well-written, great, you know, perfect length, all that sort of stuff and had nice charts in it and everything. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's an incredible story. Like I said, you know, by the time he got back, Suheili, his boat was a beast for sure, but it was, I, you look at these pictures of this just rust streaked, Oh my gosh. I mean, but it it didn't seem like it was on its last leg by any means. It just seemed like it had it had been in a major major uh battle to get around the world. And that that book really really helps. I love it and and the best part, you know, on on Sparrow that book is covered in mold still never throw it away. Um, the opening full world chart, it's like a two page, uh, drawing has sparrows route on there. And I think I scribbled in another route of somebody else. And I don't know, it's really, really cool. I, I will, that, that copy is, is a very precious book. And I, I read it many a night. I don't know how many times I've read it. It's probably embarrassing to say, but it was just that account is just unbelievable and and it really if there's ever been a time for me where i thought man i'm like 50 years too late that was it cuz boy i don't know if i would have uh had i been born back then and been in my 30s and uh compelled to do that boy that would have been interesting i wonder if i would have uh rose to the occasion or just been another bystander thinking, oh man, those guys are crazy. But, uh, yeah, so that one is, is a huge, huge, huge part of my voyage and, uh, great book. Absolutely great. A world of my own by Sir Robin Knox Johnson. And, uh, you know, I, I think just to sort of round out some of those voyage, those, the 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 early books that really got me into it uh would have to be sailing alone around the world by Joshua Slocum that that book obviously has spawned i think they they say it spawned a thousand dreams or something like that i don't know uh, but basically you know it's it's an account from 1896 i believe is when he set off and uh First person ever to go around the world in a small boat, stopping all along the way. Late 1800s, being able to go through places like the South Pacific and uh, the Indian Ocean, Australia, all that sort of stuff. It's, I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. That's, And as much as I love that book, it's one of those books that even after sailing around the world, I can't relate to to it at all because it was such a different world back then absolutely 100 percent, totally different if you were to retrace his voyage today it you you wouldn't experience anything of what he did i mean it's you know the world's just changed uh so much since then so this this book's a little different i mean it's from the days of of uh the past and that's also what makes it great because it, it's a, a little bit of an eye opener as far as where the world was and, and some of these far flung places that he stopped, especially the islands. It's just, it, it was a whole different story back then. I mean, whole different story and just what a, a cool charismatic, uh, telling of that story. It's funny. I mean, he's very, very blunt. He's, 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 talks about how all the times he screws up and and all this stuff but just the adventures it's absolutely amazing i mean if you read that book and you don't ponder at least for 10 minutes what it would be like to set sail and go around the world to parts unknown man uh you've you just i don't know it's uh it's crazy it's crazy you would you would be a crazy person not to 
want and lust after some adventures. So I think that book, I don't want to say more than all the others, but uh, I'd say initially as far as wanting to cast off the lines, so to speak, you know, throw away the idea of having to do live life a certain way and, and actually go out there and find adventure, that book will just instill it in you. It, it just will inspire you. There's there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I mean, the one of my favorite, favorite parts is just when he's trying to get into the Pacific and he's going through the Straits of Magellan and it's he's obviously has no engine. He's got he's battling the locals and the winds are just awful and he keeps getting swept back. And it's like over and over. I think it's like the sixth time he's able to finally break through and and he breaks free and then he's in and oh my gosh, it's it's an absolutely it's an amazing book. And they sell it in this little tiny travel size, uh, which is I don't know. The book's just a little bit bigger than like a credit card. Um, and it's really fat. It's funny, funny little thing. Uh, Buzz actually had one <laughs> and and I think it was on the boat for a while, but, uh, oh my gosh, it's, it's just so cool. It's, it's such a great book. And if you ever need to be inspired, if you're ever feeling like Dude, the world doesn't have anything to offer, read that book. Cause, uh, you will, you will find that the world has everything, everything to offer. So those are those are some of the solo sailing ones. Now, we do have to go back a little bit uh, to Bernard Matissier and uh, and some of the other voyages. Because after I read The Long Way, I I had to dive a little bit deeper. And probably one of my favorite books to to read about about ocean adventure and all that sort of stuff is Sailing to the Reefs by Bernard Matissier. And this was his first book, uh, I believe, and it chronicles his start from Southeast Asia, getting back to the Caribbean, and then getting back to England, or not England, but France, to then start work on building Joshua. And uh, this book is just, uh, it's almost hard to believe that this guy did what he did. It, um, it, I I just remember reading it while I was doing my training, um, sailing in between. I I still I can picture it right now me sitting in the companionway, sailing directly towards the Pitons on Saint Lucia. These beautiful, just majestic, steep, just they look like angry peaks coming out of the ocean right on this island, and I'm sailing towards it. You can see it from like forty miles away. And I'm sitting there reading, reading the end parts, trying to get into this book or trying to get through the book before I get into the island. And uh, it's great. I mean, it, he goes through, he ends up wrecking boats. Uh, it's it's the story of basically how he became how he became a great sailor. And uh, the fact that when he started, he was not anywhere near a great sailor and it also you know it sort of gave me it gave me a little bit of um i don't know it, it made me feel not so bad that the majority of things that i've learned in my life have been through screwing them up and you know realizing that that was not the right way to do that thing and uh maybe i should try something different but that's that's even though you end up screwing a lot of stuff up, I don't think as long as in the end you understand that you did that, then and you learn from it, then it's okay. And uh, I don't know, it just it's a it's a great book, and and these guys are just because he he there there's a bunch of people sailing the same route, or a handful of people all on their own boats and stuff. And these guys are this is early 1960s. They're. <laughs> They are literally penniless and just building. They've all got boats that they're building themselves. Um, they're slow. They're trying to figure stuff out. They talk about all these diagrams of everything from stuff on the boat to how they were trying to catch fish or harvest food out of the ocean and all these different places. And 
using. <laughs> he uses a slingshot to to hit uh, cormorant birds and and cooking those and and the only way they could make them actually taste good would be to do it in a pressure cooker and I I don't know it's a fascinating look into somebody that's essentially pioneering solo life at sea um and not only at sea but but also in marinas and in different countries and all sorts of stuff there's a story about him on uh this island off the coast of Brazil and I forget what was going on I think they had a cockroach infestation on their boats and so when they were walking to check into customs they would see these lizards and thought oh you know these might actually help and they put them in their pockets but then they're sitting in customs and they have these lizards that are squirming out of their pockets <laughs> it's just the the little the, the short stories in in this trip are out of this world and it's just it's absolutely fascinating um to to read it and and go through it and again you know it's it's Motissier stuff so his writing style is really unique can be a little bit slow uh to get through but um you just got to push through because it it's absolutely fascinating to see what what this guy went through to learn and to become sort of this this ocean master sort of figure in the solo sailing world i mean you know essentially he's he's up there he's probably top five um greatest solo ocean sailors just it's absolutely amazing it's a it's a funny book too because he just really screws some stuff up really bad where you just know it's coming too but um so that one's good and then the last one i want to talk about with him is um the logical route and this one was a chronicle of he and his wife basically uh, uh, taking their honeymoon. And the idea of this trip was to go leave France, go through the Panama Canal, and spend their honeymoon in the South Pacific Ocean, just cruising around Galapagos, all that sort of stuff, to Amodos, and then carry on and head to the Indian Ocean and then go through, I think, the Suez Canal. Because, again, this would have been back mid-1960s. And this was on Joshua. So it was probably like 66, maybe. And so this boat, you know, he's sort of testing it out in some ways um, as far as where he ends up going. But um, the boat is sound. He had been using it as like a, I think he was, I think he was basically... A sailing instructor um and that's what his income was when he was in france after he launched the boat uh which is pretty cool and then um yeah the two of them set off and it's chronicles or voyage but essentially what makes the book really interesting besides just getting a feel for what it was like uh in the two Amotos and in the south pacific um at that time was that at some point, I don't know if, if his wife really, really gets homesick for the kids and all that sort of stuff, but uh, they end up wanting to get back to France as quickly as possible. And he sort of just says, well, you know, uh, fastest way possible, instead of going through the Suez Canal and all that stuff, which is going to take months and months, is uh, to just head south catch the westerlies go underneath cape horn and then go right back and essentially that's what they do and it it turns out to be uh the longest double-handed uh sail to date back in 1967 and uh and yeah just an amazing voyage where they go through and and go through the rigors of being in the southern ocean but what what i found as the most fascinating part of this book because it it, the book is definitely really cool but for me it all comes to sort of the pinnacle when they get to the whole gale and i believe that's the title of the chapter where they essentially get hit by a massive massive gale and this is deep in the pacific ocean um in the southern ocean and they just it comes on and it sounds like from 
from what he describes in the book, it sounds as if they get hit by a low, but it's got it's it's one of those like big Southern Ocean bombs where you have a low in the front, but there's a much bigger extended one right behind it. And so they get hit by the first one. It's absolutely insane. He's trying to do all the stuff that he always does, finds out that doesn't work, and then changes things up. Eventually, the storm starts to let up a little bit. He can't believe he's able to survive it, blah, blah, blah. That's day one. And then the real storm comes on. And I think what is the coolest thing coolest one of the coolest things i've ever read in any nonfiction story is he does not go on to tell you what happens during the height of that storm he basically says that trying to retell that story anywhere besides next to a fire with good friends and a bottle of wine will never do it any justice and when I read that, I, one, was a little mad because I wanted to know what actually happened. But at the same time, I had to just give nothing but utter respect for the fact that he kept that that whole ordeal and what he went through uh, to himself and his close friends. That just blew me away. And again, it it it, it really built a foundation for for me thinking about my book and wanting to write it the way I want to write it, put it out there and not, not sort of, uh, not change it for anybody else. It was, it was how he wanted to tell that story and he wasn't going to tell that part. I don't know. I just thought it was so cool. It was absolutely amazing. I must've reread that chapter like three times the first time I read that book, just cause it was, now, the last one that I want to talk about as far as influential and helpful books for actually being out there and, and trying to deal with what's going on in the places like the Southern Ocean or, or any of that would be Sailing a Serious Ocean by John Kretschmer. And I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But uh, he is what I consider to be probably one of the greatest living American captains uh, in the United States. And part of the reason I think that is he takes people out into the North Atlantic in in search of just really horrific weather. The stories that he has uh, compiled over the years and decades of sailing are unparalleled and um but it's really the fact that he i i gotta put it to you this way i'm very comfortable going by myself and putting myself in danger this guy john is confident enough to not only take himself but to take other people out there knowing that he's gonna come back and he's going to get through it. And I mean, we're talking, this guy has been through hurricanes. He's been through Force 12. He's been anything and everything. And this this book is a compilation of his thoughts, his stories, what types of boats are good, why they're good. I mean, this guy, is, his, the, the amount of knowledge that this, this guy has is un, unparalleled. And that's why I think he is, he is definitely one of the greatest captains uh, in the United States as far as, uh, as far as seamanship and ability and experience goes. I, you know, he's, he's way up there with guys like Skip Novak and all that. I mean, he's really, he's the real deal. I, if I was ever on a boat with him, I, I would never, it, it would never be a question of who's, who's in charge, who's the captain. It's obviously going to be him. Um, and he, he just goes through and there's a million stories in this book and it's really informative. Uh, he talks about storm tactics that he uses, which I definitely uh, used as well. Uh, I think his most notable thing. So Mortissier, he talks about basically his his way of dealing with the big bad storm is to just run with it and 
take the pressure off the boat and just go. John does that until it gets dangerous and the boat is almost out of control. And then his his idea and what he does is he does fore reaching. So he heads back into the storm nice and slow, fully reefed down, super strong sails, very little pressure on the boat, but you're probably going to get knocked down a few times. Uh, but he finds that to be comfortable, and that's that's what uh, he likes to do. And I, I don't know, I those are like words to live by. You know, Sparrow luckily never got into that position where going with the storm. I mean, we got knocked down and stuff, but I never felt totally out of control just running in these gales. And, uh, but it was just so nice to think, okay, well, if that did get out of hand and things got scary and dangerous and I couldn't keep doing that, I at least had a different option to try. And, you know, I was basically either go hove two, depending on what the sea state is, or go and try and do the four reaching, or if you can just continue to run with it. I mean, it also depends on what your, what the situation is. You know, you might have a lee shore, you might be, there's a million different, uh, different things, but, um, or a million different situations. So it just, his, his book is great. There's, there's some good pictures and stuff like that, but it's really, it's just the stories. The stories this guy has are priceless and, uh, very well written. I mean, he's done a whole bunch of different books. Um, I think I first discovered him reading at the mercy of the sea. And, uh, that one's about three different boats that, uh, had to deal with hurricane. Oh, it had a funny name. It was back in the nineties, I think, um, the wrong way hurricane, but in any event, yeah, I mean, he's he's a prolific writer. He's done a lot of articles and all that sort of stuff. I think it's become his sort of second profession besides being a captain. And uh, unbelievable stories, and like I said, and just a, just I, I, I think every single boat should have a copy of Sailing a Serious Ocean on it, just, just as a reference, if anything at all, so... That's uh that's sort of the list of of the books that got me into getting out there, kept me safe when I was out there, and kept me company when I was out there. And uh, I can't believe that almost an hour has has already gone by. So I what I want to do is just do a quick uh notable mention, I guess. Is that even how you would say it? Um or honorary, I don't know. But in any event, just a few other books that uh, I think I, I've definitely read. Um, they didn't they didn't hit me as hard as those books that we just talked about, but uh, are definitely worth a good read if you're looking for information and um, experiences that people have had. But um, I read. Uh, well, we can just go through them. Um, oh man, no, nope, I need I need my little uh, my little phone. Well, obviously the first one is going to be um, In the Heart of the Sea, uh, and that one is by... Oh, I'm not prepared. This is just this is just terrible. Where is it? Oh, man. Okay, honorable mention. We'll, we'll go through the list as I'm going down it. Um, Blue Water Green Skipper uh, by Stuart Woods. That one is pretty cool. This guy just goes and he he gets a boat built and then he ends up doing the uh, O Star back in let's say he did it in the eighties maybe something like that but uh, very entertaining his stories are great um, I don't know it's just uh, it's an interesting book uh, about you know a guy who just felt like a change and uh, got the boat but he did it with the goal of crossing the Atlantic by himself. And uh, what he gets into there and, and some of the pitfalls and everything of commissioning a boat to be built and everything. So it's pretty funny and uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, next one is Breaking Seas by Glenn D'Amato. And this one is just, I don't know, I have, I've read this a couple of times. And it's, to me, it's sort of a cautionary tale in some respect. Basically, a guy who's not happy with his current situation, his current job, 
decides that he wants to learn how to sail and he's going to sail around the world. Um, and it's just, you know, problem after problem after problem. He takes on this whole crew of just people who just are terrible (laughs) and it just, it's just goes worse and worse and worse, but it's, it's a good read because it's a great experience. Um, you know, not all sailing stuff is going to be positive and, and right to the finish line. So I, I really, really enjoyed uh, that book, uh, Breaking Seas. It was, it was definitely pretty funny, pretty entertaining. Um, as far as entertaining books go as well, The Boat That Wouldn't Float by Farley Moat is absolutely hilarious. I mean, I'm not going to even say a word about it. All I'm going to say is it's so good, it just has to be read. It's if you ever think you're having a bad day on a boat, just read that book and you'll, you'll smile and be just so happy about your situation. Um, Imperfect Passage by uh, Michael Cosgrove. Definitely good. It's a really unique story. It has a huge twist in the end. And um, I don't know, you know, there's some aspects of it where I'm kind of like, Oh, geez, Louise. But um the guy goes out, he goes for it, he tries to do a solo uh, around the world with stopping, um, you know, he has ups and downs, crew problems, all sorts of stuff, but uh, really interesting, his experiences are definitely worth the read, for sure. Uh, and his writing is really good as well. Um, although, I gotta tell you, the one thing I didn't like about that book was that uh, it consistently had to right in there when he would say six knots and then it'd be parentheses 5.4 or 6.6 miles an hour and uh, i don't know when i when i kept having to read that i kind of felt like uh like what am i stupid that i can't figure that out (laughs) you've you've written that every single time but anyway that's just a little criticism um great book i thought it was really interesting um Oh, this one is definitely a huge favorite of mine, and that's A Storm Too Soon by Michael J. Togus. Uh, and this is about, I, I think it's 2007, The this uh, massive, massive, two, two low-pressure systems meet up. It's in May. It's in the Gulf Stream. There's footage on YouTube on the rescue. This is, I mean, these guys were in the wrong place at the wrong time, and Unbelievable, unbelievable read. Um, the account of this story is just absolutely nuts. Um, do, 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 do. The Gathering Wind by uh, Gregory Freeman I thought was really good. I don't know how factual it is as far as the account of the uh, Hurricane Sandy sinking of the bounty. Um, but it's an interesting story. I When I... This book, though, for some reason, felt uh, half and half fiction, nonfiction. Uh, for some reason, I don't know. It just wasn't a. It wasn't like reading the Perfect Storm, uh, where you felt like this is really, really what went on. Um, but definitely a really interesting perspective on what happened and why that boat was out there and why it sunk and what it was like when it sunk. Um, and really interesting about the crew, I think, more than anything. The um, the fact that they stuck behind their captain, even though uh, they lost the boat and he died and another crew member died. Crew was just faithful uh, all the way through, which I, I think is something to be said about the relationships that people bond out at sea. Um, it's it's different. It's, it's uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, Once is Enough by Miles Smeaton is a must read for anybody that's going down towards Cape Horn because if you want to learn about just how powerless you are out there, that book is going to tell you everything you need to know about it and give you two fine examples for uh the dangers that lie in those places. And it's it's like a big reality check more than anything when you read that book of just like wow, uh it gets real bad, uh, unstoppably bad. Um, this one is not about sailing, but a fascinating tale about a superstorm, and that is Fatal Forecast by Michael Togus. Wait, Michael Togus, isn't he the 
one that does the oh no 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 okay yep um and that one basically it's about lobstering but these guys get caught in the shit because of a really bad forecast um and it's absolutely horrific ernie hazard goes and survives it somehow in this i mean it's just it's unbelievable absolutely unbelievable what these guys went through and it takes place back in the mid 80s fascinating it's really really good but it's one of those books where you read that it's very very similar to uh, a storm too soon as far as kind of scary when you read it and uh, you have to sail through those waters you just it gives you a good idea of just how bad it can actually get so that's a great one. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, definitely big, big props to Sebastian Junger uh, for The Perfect Storm. A lot of people have seen the movie. Obviously, I'm a huge fan because it's a West Sale 32 that's in it, Satori. Uh, but the book is a thousand times better at telling you everything about sword fishing, lobstering, all these other things, um, and a real in-depth look into the lives of these these guys that go out there and and do this sort of, of fishing and uh, what those guys probably went through. And it gives a lot of experience of from other captains about what they've gone through. And, you know, uh, it's it's pretty pretty impressive. Obviously, super well written. I mean, that's that's probably the most popular of all these books outside of uh, Sailing Alone Around the World. But um, just a really great great book, uh, great story, and um, scary scary as well. I would I would put that right in there. Uh, and definitely have to give a quick shout out to um, South. By Ernest Shackleton. And this one, it's old school writing, old, you know, sort of English writing. And um, there's there's a lot of debate on, you know, how this how that as story actually went down and all, all that sort of stuff. But fascinating and terrifying tale of of hardship and fortitude and never giving up uh it's it's pretty cool i mean if you ever wanted to experience a sort of old englishy type um adventure story read south uh by ernest shackleton and it'll it'll take you right there something about it uh it's just really really good um and that's actually going to be Oh, okay. One last one. And I guess it's actually probably a good one to uh, end up on. And that's going to be Adrift, 76 Days Lost at Sea by Stephen Callahan. And I've listened to documentaries or listened to podcasts, listened to watch documentaries about this reenactments, read the book a bunch of times. And it's, um, I don't know, I, I think for me, it it just is a really good eye opener as far as what what's the worst case scenario that you can survive through out on the ocean and that's exactly what this book is about uh your boat sinks you're in a life raft and you're in that raft for a long time trying to keep it from sinking as well which is much harder to do than just a boat and and you're you're essentially you know when when I'm on Sparrow, I feel like there's a nice barrier. There's a border, there's a border wall uh, in between me and the creatures of the ocean. Um, and granted, that 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 wall seems pretty small when uh, uh, a forty foot whale is right next to me, but there's still that wall. Now you put me in an inflatable circle. And I am connected to the sea. I can feel every wave and there's water coming in and stuff like that. Holy cow, I would be terrified. I couldn't even imagine. Couldn't even imagine. And his description of how it all goes down is pretty great. I mean, the way he lays this book out is, I think he it was just spot on because 
it gives you just enough background to start to sort of like this guy and be like, wow, you know, I wonder how this is going to go. And then boom, it happens. And the rest of it's just like, oh, you can do it. You can do it, guy. No, that can't. Oh, no. How are you going to? And it's just, it's an amazing, amazing book. But it is, it's all about basically uh what's the worst case and uh how this guy dealt with it and how he survived and uh the fact that you can survive so worth a read for sure um so yeah we're well past an hour and that was uh sort of my condensed list that that those are the books those books are always on mighty sparrow all of those uh plus many more that i couldn't really get to but um who knows? Maybe we'll do a follow up if uh, I start uh, daydreaming about all the books that I should have <laughs> mentioned in this list. But um, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. And if you go pick up any of those, um, I'm sure you will be pretty, uh, pretty impressed. And then who knows? Maybe you'll be out there searching for a boat as well. So uh, hopefully next up, we're going to have an interview with the old man about his trip up the Erie Canal. But uh, until then, Sail safe out there, and thanks for listening. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening, and if you enjoy the podcast and want to support it, just go to podbean.com, and you can become a patron and keep the show on the air. Also, if you like the music at the beginning, the album is called Deep Teal, and the artist is Adrian Edson. It's available on Amazon Music. And if you want the full story of the trip around the world, the book, the Kindle book, and the audiobook can all be found on Amazon.com, Sailing into Oblivion, the solo nonstop voyage of the mighty sparrow. Fair winds and following seas.